we're live. I mean, <laughs> Now we're being recorded. Maybe we're talking for anybody that cares. We're talking basketball, and I'm being for anyone that cares. Everyone so cares. Like, this weekend, everyone was watching women's basketball. I know. Eighteen point three. Eighteen point seven million. Was it, was? Million it was a good game. Week. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was, it was great. great game. Scratch the last four minutes. It was an amazing game. But it was great. It was fun. I w I went to Champs Sports Bar in Burbank, which is like the like jockiest sports bar ever. And it was on almost every TV. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> times they are changing. I yeah. used to put for like a TV in the back room. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. nice. Or even on any TV. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then they would say, oh, sorry, Julia, there's no sound on this TV. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Never get sound. All I know is I think I'm going to come in second place in one pool and third place in another for the men. So, wow. Bracket? All right. Hopefully there's some money involved in that. Money is involved in one I know for sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the other one. I mean, they're second or third in the other one. I'm not sure where the money thing happens. Did you go with colored jerseys or? Uh, oh, stop it now. <laughs> I, have, I have some cred. Who do you have tonight, Julie? I have UConn. Of course. Good yeah. chance to win. Good chance to win. Yeah. Some people didn't, but I did. I Let's put it this way. I mean, I, I know a little bit. And there's one expert, I can't think of who it is, that I watch on ESPN um, when they do the brackets. And there's one guy that does it. And it's like, I always like like what he does. And I seem, he always picks like, he was the reason that I picked like that, I don't know, Duke or whatever that weird Duke game Gonzaga was. or something? No, not Gonzaga. It was even weirder than that. It was like, yeah, it started time. with a D, D-U-Q or something. Duquesne, Duquesne or, or they something, first, yeah. They won the first one. Uh, Anyways. <laughs> okay, well, there's lots to talk about. So there's basketball. There was an eclipse today. I Crazy. can't I can't wait for um Liz to get back. She went to the uh, path of totality. She's in I Texas know. somewhere. So can't wait till she comes back and tells us all about it. And I know that this was already talked about, but Andrew, I wanted to talk about it last week, but you weren't here. And afterwards I found out that Amanda's already talked about it, probably on a week that I wasn't here, but Speaking of celestial things, Orbital was so good. Yeah. It's such a good book. It's really good. I saw your um, Indie Next endorsement for that. I mean, Thank it was you. too late because it's already I know, out, but no, but... no. It, it's just Never because it's, it didn't go on a list because you read it a little too late. I read it a little it's too okay. late. All my fault. All my fault. <laughs> no, but anybody out there, it's great. like... If you didn't, if if Amanda didn't persuade you, maybe I can persuade you. Um, it's just one of those little books that I think everybody needs to read. Yeah, really um, she has been. Um, Grove has really, uh, you know, worked to develop her as a house author, and she's done some stories that were really great, and another novel, a historical novel, and it just shows the range of what she can do. She's fantastic, and oh. this book, you know. They didn't print enough. They weren't, sh they didn't know. Okay. We had to go back to print right away. Yeah. We were sold out basically before it pubbed. Wow. No, it's really good. So yeah, I'm a little, so. I'm a little late to the game, but I can't, but I got there. It's all but good. I and I want to thank you for your, um, yeah. your support of our small indie presses. We love our indie presses. We had a San Diego writers festival over the weekend. I worked, I think close to 13 hours. I'm too old for this, <laughs> <laughs> but we sold a lot of books and a lot of people came out. So it was a great weekend for that too. So anyways, lots of good stuff going on. So it's going to go Gabe, Julia, Tom, and Andrea. So Gabe, I think Amanda has you with the screen share. So take it away. Wow. We're going with the oldest first, huh? All right. Yeah. <laughs> that could be me. No, it's always me anymore. It's always you? Okay. Always me. All right. Tripped by Norman Oler. Uh, we have done a really, really, uh, I, I don't know that we've done it. I think actually it's Norman who's done it. <laughs> uh, done a great job selling a lot of books. His uh, first book, uh, Blitzed, was published, I don't know, We it was a uh, Houghton Mifflin hash, um, hardcore book and we just acquired them a couple of years ago. 
So I didn't get to sell that in, but it's one of Deborah's, one of her staff picks um, over at the other store further north. Uh, she has, she had Blitz as like, since the store opened, it's been one of her staff picks and they sell a ton of them. So it was kind of cool. And I got to start, I got to start selling Norman. Uh, it's a really great book. It's been backlisting very well. It's been in print uh, since I can't even tell you when it was first published, uh, but it was uh, definitely been about five, six years and it went into paperback and sold really well. And that was a book about the Nazis drug program they were creating the super soldiers with methamphetamine and the master race was doped out. That's why those guys were so crazy as well, because they were just all psychoticized from the uh, just new word, uh, psychoticized. I love the, it. From the drugs. Put it in the lexicon. It's going to be. Alexander Pope says, keep it of any words. Uh, so it's uh, so now as the war went on, the Nazis also because God, man, they were just really thinking ahead that culture they were uh in, they were starting to develop uh lsd which was uh, created in a swiss lab and you know that's very german adjacent um and they started playing with uh uh with um lsd and uh and and other sorts of uh uh drugs they they started with um uh, you know, natural mushrooms and psilocybin and things like that. And then they worked themselves up to the LSD. Um, but the U.S. then got involved. Um, and so this is kind of the beginning of the um, uh, the, the war on drugs, for one thing, and mm -hmm. also the policies of the time, because then all of a sudden, uh, Germany had these very anti-drug laws, even though they were really like the purveyors of a lot of a lot of this stuff, uh, the inventors and the creators. And so they had some really strict drug laws. So when the when things happened, and you know, in forty five, we split up German section, the French section, the Soviet section, and the American section. Uh, they were all interpreting these drug laws a little bit differently. So it was rife for this kind of thing, and 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 you're going to some of the effects of this these laws and these ideas um like i said sort of led to the war on drugs because they became very strict and stringent so you know there's all of a sudden the last you know 5 8 years there's been a lot of studies microdosing with uh LSD microdosing with uh mushrooms um so um a lot of and we've seen a lot of good results in like um epilepsy and certain kinds of brain triggered uh seizure things instead of medicine these uh these uh, microdoses have worked and people are starting to microdose just to expand the mind uh which i think is the purpose of all drugs um and uh, um so there's a lot of like finger pointing to these you know stupid rules from back in the day that slowed down the progress of these possible solutions and aids uh, for people who have really de debilitating kind of situations like that. So it's a book. It's Norman Oler. He's tried and true. He can really tell a really good story. He's got the history down. The science is there. And you just turn pages when you read. That's, you know, that's always my always my measure for any book. When you just, you know, sometimes you want to put it down and you're just like, I should be reading something else. So I want to read something else. But you keep turning these pages. Uh, that's what Norman Oler does. And he picks these, you know, these interesting uh, topics that are, uh, as I said, this is a 45, however many, 55 plus 20. So 75 year history, basically, of 80 year history of drugs uh, and um, very from the very basic to the current and with a bunch of Nazis and, and, and drama thrown in there. And, you know, we were, it was like part of the torture thing and, and brainwashing and, and the CIA, it was, there was some crazy stuff going on. So it's just a trip to read and a lot of fun. Um, so just remember Norman. And if you haven't read Blitz, it's available in paperback, go out and grab it. I mean, I had to put Blitz into the, um, comment section too so she put that in there as well yeah i mean the whole thing about the psychedelic is just like it it went like it should have been just something like this and we all could have done it but they went from here to like there went to the extreme and then it just became something that then it got such a, a bad reputation that everybody stayed away from it when it really probably is something that can help you know 
people with the with the, what you were just yeah. talking about. So just, there's um, lots of really good podcasts about it too. Yeah. Does he um talk about Nixon and how he wanted to weaponize um you it's, know start the war on drugs? All this it's black all folks this, and hippies. Uh, it's all this like I said, no. the war on drugs is a big part of yeah of this book. Uh, it is yeah. Yeah, the evolution of it and the origins are the Nazis, but you do see how yeah. how we got where we are today. You know, I mean, yeah. my kids, I got to say the D.A.R.E. program, that whole generation there, I'm, I, you know, my kids and I'm just like, man, they don't even like they didn't even try smoking. I mean, smoking is cool. Why would, why would you try it? But uh, but they don't even try. And yeah, most now. No drugs yeah. and stuff. It's <laughs> uh, it kind of smoking. <laughs> I'm not endorsing <laughs> it. It's just, you know. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was just watching. Smoking school about. kids. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Time out. We need so, to. <laughs> I actually said that one time at Warwick's and a woman just laid into me. I was walking. The <laughs> a woman, a customer path just laid into me about that. So it's it's always in the back yeah. of my head. I All right. We need to move on. <laughs> we can't be endorsing some of this stuff. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Julia. Take it away. I'll save you. Um, I, I have For ourselves. Yeah, exactly. I actually have um, a YA book for my first one, but it's from a very well known and beloved author, Ernest. Oh, Klein, interesting. From Ready Player One. Yep, this is his first. It's a middle grade book, actually, not YA. Um, so, uh, you know, ages eight and up. Um, and this is a really fun. It's called Bridge to Bat City. Um. It is a really fun book. Um, it's one that definitely like it takes place in Austin and it it does um, revolve around the bats over the Congress Street it, uh, under the Congress Street Bridge in Austin. Um, if you've ever been to Austin, you maybe have seen out in the uh, the dusk time. You know the bridge fills up and sort of you can see all the bats. But it's it's this great book about a kid who moves to a new place and this company is trying to um you know mess up the ecosystem basically um and uh this kid fights to save the bats um so it's a bit of a love letter to austin texas but also it reads great even if you don't know anything about austin texas and the bats there um warwick's has signed copies available um and it's out tomorrow. Uh, and again, this is Ernest Klein, the um, author of Ready Player One. So he, I mean, I don't know. When I read what Ready Player One, it felt like a kid's book in the best way. You know what I mean? Like, I, not in a bad way, in a, in a very, it was so much fun to read. I had such a great time reading it. And th that energy definitely translates to a middle grade novel for him. Um, it is just a good time um, to read this book. And he's so good at sort of capturing that voice. So I well, we have to wait till the end of this for my Ernest Klein embarrassing moment again. <laughs> oh, I, I could put the look on your face. I could tell there's a story. <laughs> uh oh, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So he meets over at Buck Expo, right? And there's that breakfast that everybody's at. So. However, I got put at his table. I'm not sure, but I did. I had no idea who Ernest Klein is. Okay, like zero. This was years ago. Okay, this was before because there's. I know there's a movie now. There's all this stuff. There's, but I was just like, and literally sat right next to him, and was trying to be like, "Who are you? What am I supposed to do?" What do you write about? What's the... such a wasted opportunity? Because there was probably a hundred booksellers that would have died to be sitting in that chair, <laughs> and it was just completely wasted on me. He was a very, very nice guy, but I felt really bad because no clue who he was. <laughs> I I'm just waiting for um your memoir to come out. It should be yes. called director of events <laughs> <laughs> well and, i thought it was gonna be um, i was supposed to i was supposed to drive colin mccann the other day for the event i was like that's a perfect name for a memoir driving colin mccann <laughs> yeah 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 true <laughs> and then i could have all of these all kinds of things anyways yeah that oh, was yeah. my Ernest klein moment but don't take away from this book <laughs> this is a good one <laughs> all right <laughs> All right, Tom. Yeah, you I might make some. You want me to save you, Julie? 
er, Ernest Klein. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you're you're about to have Anne Lamott, so maybe we'll have an Anne Lamott story soon. So uh, hopefully not. Hopefully there's a, <laughs> hopefully not. Hopefully I, I don't want to hear any but, stories, but, Julie. Nothing but boring things to say. Exactly. Um, Anne Lamott's somehow thoughts on love out last week. Um, so it's part of the series that Riverhead's been doing with Anne uh, for the last 10 years or so. Books like uh, Help, Thanks, Wow, these little um, books of, you know, um, they're memoirs in a way, but they're insightful, they're funny, they're that voice that Annie Lamott has, you know, given us for decades now. Um, this is her 20th book. Um, it's her uh, published on or near her 70th birthday. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to celebrate with with this book. Um, and it's, it came to her during COVID. So it's um, it's a, her, her response to COVID is to 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 reach out and to broaden, like to reach out to it with love to all different parts of her life, like commu her community. Um, she found love late in life. So it's also finding finding love with a partner. Um, and then her and then her son has played a role in her books from the beginning. And now he's he's a grown up, but he's still there's still moments of friction, um, disappointment. Um, and so it's about overcoming all that with love as, at the same time. So it's all these things that um, in, in that inimitable voice that's funny, that's also um, spiritual, but without being overtly Christian. Um, it's just Anne Lamott at her funny, insightful best. So awesome. it's always great to have a new Anne Lamott. So that's out now somehow. Thoughts on love. And if you're anywhere near San Diego, she will be with us on Monday. Yeah, that's I knew it was soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll be down at Point Loma with her on Monday. So well, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I can't wait because it's, it's she's always, always a great conversation when she's around too. So I mean, it goes back to Bird by Bird, which is one yep. of the quintessential books about writing and operating instructions about becoming a mother. Yep. Yeah, so it's great. We'll have all those books there. Excellent, so, and no there. stories. No, I stories. we were we're hoping. Although, 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 now you maybe you already have a story. Well, I am driving her, so oh. I, I am responsible for her to and from okay. the event. So there could driving Anne Lamott could be my. <laughs> <laughs> Fill subsection. in the blank. Driving, fill in the blank. Yeah, driving, fill in the blank. Oh, create your own adventure. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> I'm going to do a create your own adventure book. Oh my God, I love it. All right, Andrea, what you got for us? Um, I am very ex excited to finally be able to talk about I Cheerfully, hey. I Cheerfully Refuse by Leif Anger, um, international and national bestseller of books such as Peace Like a River. That was his first book. And um, he has a, um, a a huge following of adoring fans and it couldn't happen to a nicer person. He's one of um, our in-house favorite authors. And um, as you can see here in my notes, a career defined tour de force from New York Times bestseller, et cetera. Um, and um, this one um, couldn't be more timely. Um, um, it revolves around um, a post-collapse America. It's a um, picaresque. Um, it's a an odyssey um, that ensues um, around um, our protagonist, the bereaved Rainy. His beloved wife has been murdered in their home. She's a bookseller. And it was it's very dangerous in post uh, collapse America to be a bookseller. Um, books um, are banned, burned, and otherwise discarded by um, the powers that be. And he's in search of he goes on this odyssey. He's in search of some sign of his departed wife, um, and he sails around um, Lake Michigan um on a little boat he has to fix up a boat that he's had in like you know the his garage for a while um and um and this like what he encounters is this dystopian world um that um is dictated dictated by it may sound familiar an illiterate president 
an extreme <laughs> government, pandemics galore, um, and gross income disparity um, that makes a lot of people out there very dangerous. Um, along the way, he picks up um, a, uh, not, not picks up, um, <laughs> invites to uh, like come out of her terrible situation, a young girl um, who's got a pugilistic uh, personality for sure. Like um, he, Leifinger has a way of writing young kids very well. And uh, this is another one here in this story. Um, and as you can tell, um, there are a lot of things go on. There's fires. Here's the boat in the um, in uh, the cover there. And the cover is actually a photograph of a gorgeous, what seems to me a gorgeous quilt that has been um, made by his wife. So um, the, fam the whole family um, are artisans. His son is an amazing um, woodworker and um, cabinet maker. So there you go. Um, this just has all the elements of a great yarn, um, and the book element is nice, books about books, and um, we think that this is going to go gangbusters. There's um, a lot of signed copies stacked up at Warwick's right now, and um, just we're just so happy for Leif and... Um, you know, we've, we've, we've known him for a long time. We've been selling his books for a long time. It was, it was one of the first books that I sold for Grove and Publishers Group back Group West back in the day. Um, and this is really great. Um, during an appearance, he showed up um, on a Zoom call um, during a sales conference for the spring list. And um, he said that he felt compelled uh, to write this novel to explore what happens when individuals and societies choose al alternative facts over truth. And I think you really nailed it here. So um, there you go. I'll shut up now, but this book is wonderful and it deserves a long explanation. Yep, and he's wonderful. He's, and so I'm glad Amanda put in because we get to host him on June 18th. So I'm so excited that he's coming to San Diego. So we're kind of getting I think he's going to go fling out. Now he's touring and then he's going to come back around again to the West Coast. Yeah. So, um, so great, because I think you're going to sell out of those signed copies, but you'll have more correct. at the event. And Dee on here is so happy that somebody's talking about this because she went, no, we won't, we won't throw out any names, but she went to her indie and they didn't even have it. So Warwick's is in the know. We're always, we're always going to have huh. what you need here. Huh. Um, that's quite odd. I uh, uh, no. It's an April 2nd. Hub, so last get, week. yeah Tell maybe you, maybe they sold out and they're reordering no, that's, it. that's what i'm hoping we're that's gonna we're hoping. gonna go with that we're gonna go with that but leaf is a great guy i mean he's such a nice guy so um, couldn't happen I, to a nicer man yep no love him okay okay what you got next i have it's not what i know anticipation's killing me Oh, she's showing a stop. What happened? But I see you shiver with anticipation. Well, where's the public service message? Say no to drive. <laughs> 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 Just say no. Just say no. And then how to end a love story. Not what I would consider my kind of book. Um, but it is a book that I have to talk about, man, because I would show you the mer uh, merch, the publicity package in the old days when we used to get like staple sheets of pages. It's just pages and pages of magazines, uh, any journal, physical paper, online, gazillion blogs, TikToks. I mean, this book is so highly anticipated. It's a paperback original. It is. Ex it's what. It, it's what you're looking at. This is a. a, a you want to call it rom com, light romance, whatever you want to call it. Um, this is exactly what it is. But I wish we were more interactive. I would. I could have uh, attached some links that you could pull and you could uh, check it out. But. Google this and you will see like people weeping on TikTok. You will see people <laughs> telling you what an amazing read this is. It's really quite a phenomenon. There was actually a, and before that, I am always 
skeptical of, you know, our editorial people are gatekeepers. They mostly live in New York. They mostly went to about the same kind of schools and how do, you know, we're the arbiters, they're the arbiters and then it dribbles around and then you guys and then the booksellers and, and then you, uh, the ultimate consumers word of mouth. Uh, but, you know, this book was, there was just this huge bidding war for this book. Uh, there, everybody was involved. There was a lot of money spent. Uh, there were a lot of big bids uh, turned down. Uh, this is quite the phenomenon. And uh, so editorially, it, when people read this, they they all felt uh, something special in this book. And it's gone down to the, you know, we've sent galleys out and early readers um, to booksellers and to blog sites. And then just, you know, we have lists of readers that we send things to to get some feedback and the feedback has been incredible. And I said, as I said, the media feedback has been incredible. So how to end the love story. It's the fr enemies to friends to lovers story. Um, it is uh, Yulin Kwan. You heard it here first. We're going to have to rebrand Jules. We're going to have to take a break. I and think so. I think we got to rebrand this. Uh, Cause this is the kind of thing that it, it's just, it happens in publishing every once in a while, some bug starts buzzing down low and it doesn't look like a big deal. It's just a paperback original. You hope to sell a few thousand, a few tens of thousands. And uh, but I think this is just it's it's madness what's going on with this book. So the anticipation, attention, it got a starred uh, library journal, a starred book list. Uh, so it's getting editorially good reviews. It's not just like you know, it's uh, not just like oh we loved it because it made us cry. It's editorially. It's uh, people are saying there's some fine writing in here. I mean. Uh, there's like all the superlatives. Everything's yeah. aligning for it because you think that, I mean, there's so many of these that get published, but it's like it, very, very few make it above the April, fray. April Henry's, you know, this is April Henry. Oh, Emily, 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 Emily Henry, Henry, Emily Henry, Emily Henry yeah. which is exactly what I was thinking. I saw her name on the cover, of course, but, but that's what happened with Emily Henry. I didn't know, I had no idea what to expect. Nothing like what she's become. So it sounds like this exact same phenomenon. Yeah. So Dee's on here and she said, what? Gabe's recommending a romance? She says it must have been the drugs from the earlier book. I'm blaming the eclipse. <laughs> it's obviously the eclipse. Obviously the eclipse. There is something going on in the universe today. <laughs> What's happening? Spiders. I'm seeing well, things. And it sounds like they're at some point going to adapt this into like you know, it's a TV. probably already in the. I bet you it's. It, like I guess there's so much yeah. attention. I bet I just even. It's probably in, in the facts sheets that I've yeah. got. But it's yeah. just like I said. But it's yeah. one of those things. Though, I mean, it's got to have some charm because it's like as much as, as much as you think that those things. I mean, it still has to be organic. Yes. You know, with all of that, tick, all the TikTok and all that. It's it has to, it has to have something. Right. Yeah. Um, you see the pretenders that come out with whatever right. adults to writing the, the kids' book. To the great or, frustration of publishers, like we were. We would prefer to tell you what to read in these, right. these categories, but no. Right. But yeah. in, and I think that there's some authors that are out there trying to chase this. Right. And you can't manufacture yeah. and you can't chase it. It you has can't. to just come. It's just a really organic thing that happens with some of this, with some of these phenomena like that. So kudos. All right, yeah. Julia. It's awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get everyone ready for dinner. Um, okay. I have, a, I have a cookbook. The Ooh. Book of Pinchos. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen so that you can see some of the, is that the, is that to celebrate my Basque heritage there? Exactly. I thought Thank Julie, you. I know Julie is Basque and let's celebrate that. <laughs> so it's, so, it's all about thing, me. Anyway. A thing that I definitely knew. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, pinchos are these small bites of Basque country. Um, as Julie said, um, I looking at this as sort of like a book that if you want to like, if you're like a big charcuterie board person and you want to step up your charcuterie game a little bit, something like this, these little skewers, mm. um, they're like, it's so much fun. Um, I've had such a great time just like going through this whole book. It's obviously it's like brightly colored and well laid out and also talks to you about what pinchos are and, you know, sort of like how they fit into um the culture of the Basque region and San Sebastian particularly um and they're just these delightful little um you know bite size sort of um nibbles you can see there's some desserts as well um I don't know I've been having so much fun with all these cookbooks um that I get to to 
sell now and have been having so much fun sort of making stuff from them. Um, I really, I'm a big fan of like a, a little nibble dinner or a girl dinner, as they were saying on the internet not too long ago. Um, and, uh, and so um, this is, I think, a great one and also a great sort of like, it's a little bit different than what I think a lot of people are used to, but um, ingredients that you can find easily and sort of fun to put together. So like well, that's the thing too. It's like, it's, it's really, it's deceive, deceiving because when you think of like small things, but there's so much flavor and so much that you don't need a ton. Um, yeah. And if you're ever, I mean, when you tour the Basque country and usually they're included with your glass of wine at the bars. And so it's really, it's quite yeah. a fun little touring Pintos tour that you could do. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. You know, um, up here where I live in the Eastern Sierra, there's a lot of Basque people because of the uh, sheep shepherds, herding. the sheep herding back in the day. And um, a lot of those folks, even if they weren't doing sheep, they did a lot of ranching up here and helped ranchers. Um, they're good um, cowboys. And, good solid stock is what we're saying yeah <laughs> and um, very cool people um you know it's they're fun to drink wine with but um one thing i remember from when i was a kid um we were in gardnerville up the road 395 like you know a good 200 miles or so or 180 miles and my grandfather took me into this uh basque bar and restaurant because he wanted to talk to an old friend in there and um we had some soup and it was the best soup I've ever had it was this like tomatoey garlicky soup that was the best soup I've ever like put in my pie hole and um I am telling you Basque food is great and that was that's where it started for me is that soup back yeah. in the day back in the day I never forgot that soup I know never I I'm like, gonna look and like, see I am There's thinking about it now. I'm like, where can I? You where know, can I go? Is that bar still around? Uh, and I love, yeah. And I love the um the bakery that's real famous up by you, um Andrea, Eric something yeah, or no, other. Yeah, a Shots Bakery. That's my um my cousin's oh, yeah. uh my cousin Paul Shot is the um heir oh. to Eric Shot um okay. and the bakery, and they He's do a, uh, they mm. do a Basque sheep herder. Yes, they do. Bread. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yes, they do. Okay. Pam, uh, Beth Penny, who is our um, wonderful person who does our social media and does our um, Instagram. She's on here schooling us about Yulin Kwan. Um, so she's a screenwriter adapting Emily she's Henry's cute. Beach Read and People You Meet on Vacation. Okay. Ah. So there's a little connection there. There is a connect. So there you go, Beth. Yeah, thank she you. Is a Beth. Excellent. All right. All right, Tom. I'd like to find a way to tie my book into you, Julie, but I, I am maybe I'll get there as I talk. That might be the new theme that we have to do. I know. I'm I'm feeling it. <laughs> new in paperback, The Dog of the North. <laughs> Please McKenzie. tell me I'm not a dog of the north. Um there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things here, but not, none of them relate to you, Julie. None okay. at all. The the quirky characters, the yeah. road trip, the no, no. none of that. No. No. Um, so Penny Rush is the main character, and she is a she's a mess at the beginning of the book. And to some extent, a little bit at the end of the book. But um, she her marriage has just failed. She lives in Santa Cruz, she's quit her job. Her her grandparents live in Santa Barbara. So she gets on the road to Santa Barbara. So then there's a big section in Santa Barbara. And these characters, her grandmother is Dr. Pincer who is a um, quirky, eccentric woman who does ex these weird experiments and police are investigating. Um, there in Santa Barbara, she uh, finds the Dog of the North, which is a van, an, a very old van and a dog, which you can see on the cover. There's the van, the van and the dog, Quicotes. Um, but really what this book is about is, so it's about family and it's about, um, it, it takes you from uh, California to Australia because her, because Penny's parents disappeared in Australia. She ends up going to Australia in search of her parents who literally disappeared. They went out into the outback and never came back. So it's, there's a lot of, you know, dark themes to this book, but it is fun. She, Elizabeth McKenzie is always funny um always the characters are always uh, you've never met them before they are eccentric they are weird but lovable in a strange way um so this is a it's a book that sneaks up on you because it is really funny but it's a it's a very really great piece of work um it's a finalist for the la times book prize which will be announced in a couple of weeks for fiction 
It was a New Yorker best book of the year. Um, and Ron Charles uh, in the Washington Post said, I'm in love with a grieving misfit driving around with a donkey shaped pinata in an old van held together by duct tape. The great miracle of Mackenzie's writing is how she manages to transform misery into gentle humor. And it's darkly hilarious. So this is a book to be re to be rediscovered or discovered in paperback. We've given it a, a brand new look. Um, Elizabeth Mackenzie's Dog of the North. And I think she's like quietly one of the best California writers. She's um, she writes about California. She lives in California. Um, she's and she's like no other writer you've ever read. I, I love it. I love it. So I might have to come. I might have to come to that one late too. No, that it's yeah, it's good. You, it it yeah, has great. Yeah, it has some of your. <laughs> I think your eccentric humor, Julie. I guess, and and I do like a dark story. So yeah, this book, this book gets you, Julie. I got it. Gets me. It's not about me. It gets me. <laughs> Thomas, she she's from Santa Cruz, right? Yeah, she is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, her previous book was The Portable Veblen, which is also fantastic. Oh, right, 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 right. I, I feel like that. I hosted her a number of years ago at Book Soup. I bet you did. And we like bonded over, you know, because I'm from Santa Cruz. Oh, sure. So right. We bonded over Santa Cruz things. Yeah. Maybe it was The Portable Veblen. It's been a while. I bet it was. Oh, it's, I cannot remember. Okay. Well, it might have remember. even been before that, though, because that's not that old. And you've been, yeah. yeah. Anyways, <laughs> thanks, Julie. <laughs> you've been very wild. I don't know what to say to that, but hey, Julie, just come to me you. if you want to make you yourself feel good. Just come sit <laughs> next to me. I'll, you, I'll give you, make you feel really good about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> bitter, bitter. Someone sounds bitter. Oh, carry on, uh, Andrea. <laughs> So um, April is not only the cruelest month, but it is National Poetry Month as well. And so I thought maybe we should talk about some poetry. Excellent. Um, from one of our great um, poetry strong houses, Milkweed Editions, out of uh, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, you are here, Poetry in the National World. This is edited by the 24th poet laureate of the United States, the fabulous Ada Limon. Um, and uh, I've talked about her work here before, her standalone work. She's amazing. Um, and if you are on Instagram, follow her. Uh, she has a great uh, feed and um, is so positive and is a great, um, you know, is, she's doing what a poet laureate should do. Um, and, and that is, uh, you know, being a um, advocate um for poetry for verse and um she rocks so this is published um in conjunction with the library of congress so it's got that nice uh extra special imprimatur on on this book as well and it's um 50 um previously unpublished unpub poems from um highly uh beloved and famous um, contemporary poets, Joy Harjo, Diane Seuss, uh, Rigoberto Gonzalez, uh, Jericho Brown, um, Amy uh, Netsukumamato, uh, who wrote World of Wonders, excuse me for um, butchering your name, Amy. Um, but if you don't like say it all in one fell swoop because it's five syllables long. You're done. Open. Paul Tran, um, just like, it's just amazing who's in this collection. And um, it's basically about um, um, uh, a sense of place um, as seen through nature. And um, it's a great cover. And um, God, this is just a great little, I think it's a, a great little um, gift book for anybody in your life who likes poetry. And also if you just want to um, acquaint yourself with what's going on in the poetry world, this is the uh, collection for you. Um, it is a great, it is a really good cover. That's a great cover. It's a great cover, love it. And um, so happy that we get to publish uh, Miss Limon, she's amazing. And um, we're all lucky that we're on the planet at the same time as she, that's how I feel. Awesome. All right, Poetry Month. I, I read a, um, a cause I, I, in fact, I don't ever read poetry and somebody asked me to do a blurb for it, um, for a collection. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed doing it. 
was something completely out of my wheelhouse. Completely out of my wheelhouse. So really? I think I need to get. I've never. No, I don't read poetry. I need to get you a copy of this because this is like it's it's in some ways because there's 50 contemporary poets in here. It's like a survey of okay, like you know the stars of contemporary poetry. Right. So that would be good for you. Because for me, it was one of those things. Was like. I didn't really know how, because I think blurbing fiction and blurbing poetry is two kind of different things. Yeah. And so it taxed my brain a little bit. <laughs> really? I think Her- I did. Writing about a hermit named Dave, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Have I, I talked about hate you lately? <laughs> I can't help it. Well, this is something that you can add to your memoir, Julie. There you go. Another th- Another thing. There you we know. go. Pretty soon you'll be like reading for the National Book Awards or something in the poetry or something. I, I'm telling you. Well, I'm doing something. You're bona fide. <laughs> we'll talk about it after. All right. Okay, Gabe. Lightning round. We're at lightning, lightning round. round. Oh, yeah, we're taking a little bit of time today, which is okay. We got some good books. Well, yeah, I also wanted to point out my my Basque in this. There's actually a town named Bereas in Navarre that uh, at the edge of Basque area of Spain. Ooh. Where apparently my... And some antecedent. One would yeah, be. it's really interesting when you That's do cool. the 23 and me for the Basque. Um, for it's very interesting how those DNA things describe the Basque, you know. Really it's are. it's very interesting. I'm not a unique that. breed. I'm <laughs> keeping my DNA to myself. Uh here we go. Ian Fleming. And if I can get my if I can find my Annie Lamont, I loved Rosie, her first book, her first novel. If I can find Oh yeah, my, yeah. I just love that little book. Uh, she's written, she's not known as a novelist, but she's she's good too. Yeah, those that's where she's you know the first three books were novels. So yeah. I read, I really liked the a couple of them. I thought were really great. But wait, it, before you go on, I guess Amanda put in the thing. There was a New York Times article about Ada Limon on the Sunday NYT review book review. So uh, look for, there we go. Okay, I Ian Fleming, the complete man. Uh, you know what? You don't need to be a uh, James Bond fan to appreciate Ian Fleming's really interesting life. This dude had it really going on. Um, he had this um, uh, kind of imprinted in his mind by his grandmother to be the complete man. And it's something that, I, you know, when you're creating yourself, are you going to, um, he wanted to be, you know, be a complete, he wanted to be uh, an, an athletic, he wanted to be, a military, he, you know, he wanted to just sort of encompass the whole world uh, beyond the Renaissance man, perhaps. But he was really an interesting dude, very intelligent young man, grew up in uh, Britain, born in 1909. He died at 56. Uh, so he was young, he had a heart attack. So he lived hard, uh, played hard. He was a uh, big traveler and he had a really interesting background in that he was involved in the Naval uh, uh, Secret Service. Uh, and and uh, uh, so he was, you know, I mean, he was one of the original original spies uh, during uh, the Second World War. Um, and that gave him a whole completely different background and playing different people, being a different person, um, research, it, so this book has got all that stuff in it. It's uh, it's just really filled with a lot of really fun facts. Uh, what what made Ian Fleming uh, such an interesting character? You know, he only wrote, he was only an author for like the last 12 years of his life. So that for an author's career, when you think of somebody like a Leaf Anger, um, they wait like 12 years between books, for goodness sakes. Um, so he wrote Rat-a-tat-tat. Uh, created uh, somewhat of a genre, uh, a great franchise uh, of movies, um, but it really is all sort of generated from who the, who he was that has sort of created this world of Ian Fleming that exists today. I mean, I remember being a kid and when a James Bond movie came out, I'm talking like Thunderball days, it was a big deal. Right. And I, you know, I just, uh, when my son's now a grown man, but when he was, uh, you know, in his teens, you know, 15, 18, 19, I, you know, I'd we'd be cleaning, cleaning his room, whatever, on a Saturday, and I'd come in and he's watching, you know, the Roger Moore 
James Bonds, the latest James Bonds, whatever, James Bond and the new movies are, are, are in events still. So it all comes from the sort of bigger than life personality that Ian Fleming was. And this book has garnered some, again, real strong attention. Publishers Weekly gave it a start review. Kirkus gave it a start review. Booklist gave it a start review. Getting really good uh, literary attention as well. So I'm excited to present this. And like I said, you know, I don't think you have to be a, um, if you like a good memoir, uh, this is not a memoir. If you like a good biography, but this biography, kind of reads yeah. almost yeah, this kind of reads like that. It's a little more homey than just sort of this kind of uh, commercial kind of a book. It's a really uh, fun, fun read. Uh, interesting character, and I think Nicholas Shakespeare's a real. I'd never read anything that he'd uh, any of his biographies before, but I was really really impressed by what he did here. Just a lot yeah. of fun. But I also think that it's it, it's a cultural phenomenon that it's still to this day. Yeah. That, like you said, I mean, it's who's going to be the next James Bond. I mean, how many, you know, it's incredible. So what Our he fight's created, discussing, you know, there's a fascinating that he created and, and totally have been alive for 56 years. I mean, he put packed a lot into those 56 yeah. years. Incredible. OK, Julia, what do you got for us? OK, I've got a fun last one. Um, it is um, from the moment they met, it was murder. Double and Dead in the Rock film noir. Um, this is a Turner from Turner Classic Movies, um, who we've been doing a series of books with. Um, and this is a really fun uh, book about the making of um, Double Indemnity, of course, directed by Billy Wilder with the great Barbara Stanwyck. Um, and uh, this one, what I think is really fascinating about this is, um, and maybe some people don't know that Double Indemnity was a sort of ripped from the headlines um, film. And um, part of the Hollywood code, um, censorship code made it so that when the, so the, the thing happened in 27, there was all this like um, bidding wars and stuff um, mm -hmm. after James M. Cain wrote his novella of mm -hmm. Double Indemnity. Um, and then people were like, well, you can't make this because of the censorship code. So it it actually like has a really fascinating um you know, from page to screen, pa the pages of newspapers to the page of a novel to the page of to, to the screen um, story. And then also talks about sort of the beginnings of film noir and this genre that people love so much. I still love to watch a film noir. Gilda is my favorite film noir. Uh, um, but good, that's um, a good one. That's good yeah, one. It's a terrific movie. Um, I also stand hard for Sunset Boulevard. But um, uh, anyway, so um, just a great book if you're a film nerd uh like me uh it's a very fun one and i thought a good ending um to today yeah no i love it and i also love those old pictures there's no there's nothing better than old hollywood pictures they're just they, there's nothing that you can duplicate it these days they're great sure and billy them. wilder was the wilder script you know. amazing and i remember i love double indemnity but when I first saw it, I knew Fred McMurray only as the as the dad in my three sons. I was like, "What is happening? To What's me? happening?" Yeah, same here. Same here. I don't think I've ever been the same. Then later, I saw him in the apartment, and then all was I off. mean, all bets were off. <laughs> Twist in the brain. Oh, listen. Right, I um, mean, and like, she is so amazing in it. I mean, anything yeah. she does, like Barbara Stanwyck is. I'm sorry, Amanda. I'm going to say magisterial. I know I'm not allowed. Hey, that might be it's, a it's April. I don't think you've said it in April yet. Yeah. So we're wow. Man, <laughs> she just like eats up the screen. You know, sure. she's amazing. What she can do just with like one little look or like one small gesture. It's just like, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Okay. Um, I have a fun one. The Sicilian in Inheritance by Joe Piazza. So this is the first time we published Joe Piazza, but she is she her last book was a Good Morning America pick that was called We Are Not Like Them. But this I think is a change from the, this is a different kind of book than she's done before. But it's it's like catnip for a lot of readers, including me. So it's it's a historical novel. It's got a mystery at its heart, and it's set in Sicily. So. Perfect. I mean, what more could you want as you begin? So we're gliding into summer reading. This is going to be a great summer book. So, and it's based on, so Joe Piazza's 
great grandmother. There was a lot of mystery around her back, what happened to her back in Sicily. All, and, and then I think the word, the, the tales were told as they were passed down generation to generation that she was killed for the land that she was on. Um, so it takes, so she's taking a story from her family's past, which is shrouded in mystery and created a novel around it. So it's a, a woman today who is investigating what happened to her great grandma or grandma uh, back in, in Sicily. Um, so it takes you takes you to that place, to that town, um, when then, of course, there are uh, the forces that may or may not have murdered the, the grandmother are still around. So there's the so there's danger, there's mystery. But most of all, it's the set. I mean, for me, it's the setting of Sicily. And that's what the reviews are saying. The New York Times published a great review the other day or maybe yesterday saying um, you just want to you just want to eat Sicilian food and you want to travel to Sicily. Um, so it's perfect, uh, you know, escapist reading for those of us who have uh, watched White Lotus, for example. I mean, this is a book that um, this is going to be a really fun to read all summer. Yeah. Long. So that's but it's like, what, yeah, was it the Sicilian? What, what's the, the title? Sicilian inheritance. inheritance. But it was like, what um, was it? Beautiful, beautiful ruins. Beautiful ruins. You know? Yeah, I know. I, I mean, anything set there. Right. In. And uh, yeah. And I love the, the cover gives you that sense right away. Awesome. Super. Perfect war and a perfect Warwick's book, I think. Perfect Warwick's book. Perfect Warwick's book. And like you said, I mean, that's going to be all through the summer. That's going to be yeah. out there for sure. Okay, Andrea, take us home. Um. Okay. I uh, want to talk about the latest from Alexandra mm -hmm. Fuller, who wrote "Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight," and um, which was a sensation and a bestseller back in the day. Um. This um. Uh, is a memoir of her son um, uh, around the time that um, she turned 50. She was uh, like uh, grieving the loss of her father. Um, she had had a breakup a, a little uh, bit of time earlier. She was um, uh, opening herself up to a um, new relationship with a younger woman. And then her son, Fee, uh, 21 dies suddenly in his sleep and it just throws her like a loop as you can imagine um and um and this is uh like her dealing with that and um the writing is um incredible as in anything she does i mean you know the like you know uh, people say the new york times who boy can alexandra fuller write um you know, um, Terry Tempest Williams, Alexander Fuller has always been a brave writer. We count on her bare bone, carefully crafted truths laced with wit and wisdom. And um, you can apply, you know, these sorts of uh, high praise endorsements uh, to this book as well. Um, uh, this is um, this was edited by the executive um, uh, editor at um, Grove, Elizabeth Schmitz. She says she was riveted um, from the opening line, um, which is uh, which she shared it as, with us at um, um, at sales conference. Uh, quote: "Fair to say, I was in a ribald state the summer before my fiftieth birthday, um, and so begins this like uh, you know extraordinary um, memoir." Um, uh, Elizabeth Schmidt's like, you know, she's got a good eye. She brought us, um, when she was just a youngster, she brought us Cold Mountain, which of course was one wow. of those books that would have been a TikTok sensation back in the day. It was word of mouth. It sold millions of copies just from the indies, the indie booksellers, like hand selling that to everybody who walked into stores because it was such an amazing novel. So, um, you know, so it's got um, her like a uh, keen eye and um, her editorial sensibilities here. Um, but, you know, you don't have to tighten up um, any book that Alexandra Fuller writes. It's just like she, she, you know, it's coming to you and it's in beautiful shape. Well, and so, I would um, add that, that uh, uh, we published Alexandra Fuller for a long time and uh, Anne Godoff, one of the legends of publishing Peng at Penguin Press, I think maybe until this book, she edited all of her books. So to your point, editor, the, the highest um, level of editors have always 
been drawn to Alexandra Fuller's work because she's yeah. that good. Yeah, that she's good. Um, and then one more thing, because I know it's lightning round. Um, Helen McDonald, the author of H's for Hawk, another great Love writer, her. said, a truly extraordinary memoir about a mother's loss of her son. Beautiful, fearless, raw, and an utterly compelling read. So, you know, this is, you know, some people are afraid of like, you know, the grief memoir, but I think this is so much more than that, just because her sentences are works of art. Yeah. Well, and I think it's one of those things that people that have gone, even if you haven't gone through the experience, I mean, it, it's, there's not a word for somebody when they lose a child. You know, when you lose a spouse, you're a widow, when you lose a parent, yeah. you're an orphan, you know, and so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, un, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but it's, it's something that shouldn't happen. And so somebody yeah. being able to write about it is incredible. There so, should be a word too, you know, yeah. it's a serious um, lack. Yeah. Um, Tom, on here from the Sicilian Inheritance, so Dee is letting us know that the author is creating a podcast to solve that mystery. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Excellent. Oh, so that's going to be an interesting one. Yeah. All right. There was lots of really good books this week. Um, so many to choose from. I think I, if I'm gauging things too, this whole season's got just so many good books. So lots of good stuff to come too. So get your reading hats on. <laughs> and, never, and i'll never try, took them off and you haven't took them off and i mean and i i will try and be a little more up to date than things that have published five months ago <laughs> <laughs> oh i didn't know that that book isn't brand new no it came out like just, the oh no. i thought it just came out oh. no that's why i was give i was berating myself because here uh, can i what's what's the thing that the Illuminati or whatever hey listen we much? we're calling it a new <laughs> release okay come on okay. new me, and noteworthy yeah. Yeah. New when, and Julie, when Julie finds a book, it's brand new. It's to brand new to me. Yeah. It's yeah. New to no me. such thing as backlist, man. You might have seen me quoted in Shelf Awareness many, many years ago when I said <laughs> that at a thing. And uh, I think it holds true. I think it holds true. It's new to me. New all to right, everybody. everybody. Thank you all for tuning in. And we will see. You. I will not be here next Monday, but Amanda will be. I forgot to ask you about that, Amanda. Hopefully you will be. I'll be <laughs> I'll be in everything. I'll be in everything Annie Lamont or Ann. Is it Anne or Annie? Annie. That's a good question. Oh, Annie. Annie. I mean that we I've heard both. I would okay. yeah. Well, I'm driving her. I better find figure um, it out. She well, she it she puts Anne on her books. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes I think she pronounces the E. I don't know. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, you can ask her. Say, I know. you know. Yeah, just you might what should I call you? <laughs> She'll appreciate that. I hope so. All Maybe. right. <laughs> yeah, that could be my story. How she really didn't appreciate it and stopped talking to me. For well, you can call ride. her Ms. Lamott the whole time. <laughs> <Yeah>. mm. <laughs> Ms. Lamott. All right. Bye, everybody.